Yes, you can write copy that attracts your ideal client and reflects your personality. How? Apply some of the tips and tricks that Jess Dury, Wordsmith Extraordinaire or Copywriter at hardlinescopywritingstudio.com shares during this in-depth Copywriting for Coaches Masterclass. You will learn how to use your personal archetype when writing copy, how to breathe life into your words by mastering story plots, how to edit your first draft and turn it into a masterpiece, and how how to escape the blinking cursor curse. Yes, we've all been there and whether short or long copy is the way to go and the reason why headline formulas hurt your business and so much more. Chess spills the beans on everything copywriting so you can turn your words into sales. Grab a pen and paper and maybe a cup of tea or a glass of wine as this episode will be a longer one and get ready because you won't want to miss a thing. Trust me, you will get the inside scoop and behind the scenes secrets you most likely have never heard before when it comes to copywriting. Also, you can uplevel your writing to grow your coaching business. Now, without further ado, let's welcome in Chess. Hi Chess, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Chess is actually joining us from Ontario, Canada tonight. And I've heard it's freezing cold there. Is that right? It is cold and it's snowing already. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. It's kind of mid of November and here in Australia, it's actually getting super hot. But let's not talk about the weather. Let's talk about obviously copywriting for coaches. And Chess, do you mind sharing a little bit about your journey? Kind, I know you first were a teacher and then you kind of became or your calling was a copywriter. Are you willing to share a little bit about that journey? Sure. So yeah, I started out with uh, degrees in history and psychology and education. And then I taught high school English for a number of years um, until I decided to become a mom. And then I stayed home. I quit teaching, stayed home with my kids. And after a few years of nothing but ABCs and nursery rhymes, I felt like I had to do something else. Um, I knew that I did not have the personality to do those MLM parties every week. I just sounded exhausting and horrible. I also know that I am not crafty. I was never going to be the person that has the cake decorating business or the knitting business. Um, so I really kind of looked at my skill set and thought, what is the one thing that you have always done really well and really loved? And that was writing. And so I started with, uh, Wow. It was more of a creative writing course at the University of Toronto because I was like, I don't know what to do. We'll just go back to university. And the prof was a copywriter and he explained what that was. And I did not even know that that existed as a job until he said that that's how he actually made most of his money, not as a university prof. And that just became this deep dive for me. I started taking course after course online from the uh, American Writers and Artists Institute and then I found a bunch of copywriters online like Ash Amberge, and I took all of her courses back in the day. And I just kind of opened up shop one day uh, <laughs> with a one page website. And, uh, and that was it. Wow, that's incredible. Like it sounds a little bit like coaching journey, right? The moment you kind of dig in or get first in touch with uh, really uh, what does personal development actually mean? There are just so many more resources that you want to explore and dig deep and deep and deeper and deeper. Um, so that's incredible. And how do you use, I mean, you just said you did psychology, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you apply maybe this right now in copywriting? That has uh, a lot to do with the brand archetypes that I use. So mm -hmm. um, there are 12 uh, brand archetypes based on Jungian psychology. And when I first got into copywriting, it was more the old school direct mail style copywriting. The and from one? there, pardon? The sleazy one? Yes, the sleazy ones, <laughs> the ones that come in your mail still today and you just toss like without even checking. Yeah. That's what the original copywriting that I learned. Then I kind of got into this whole creative copywriting and brand copywriting. And that's where I fell in love. And then that kind of led me down the branding wormhole. And I realized people were using archetypes uh, to create brands and I could use archetypes to create a brand voice. And it felt like a very natural extension from the psychology. And the, I always preferred Jung over Freud anyways. <laughs> um, and into the writing, I could just see how they merged. 
Wow. So you did write a book also about the archetypes, right? Yeah. And I think I wrote it in 2016. So a number of years ago, or I published it in 2016. I probably wrote it in 2015. <laughs> um, and a lot of that was me getting clear. You know, the way that I get clear about something is I write it out. I'm a writer. And so the book was about... It was about publishing a book, something I had always wanted to do, but it was also about being able to clearly articulate the brand archetypes and what that meant for you in your words. So and how would you say that the kind of the, the brand archetypes change your copywriting? I know you prepared a little bit about, you know, um, a brand essence statement for us, but how would you say that knowing your brand archetype, and it's actually not about your clients, it's about knowing your brand archetype. Like I think mine was when um, I first worked with you together, we found out it's explorer, artist, and visionary. So how does that actually just in a kind of a few sentences influence the copywriting and maybe help you become a better copywriter? So brand archetypes are universally recognized patterns of behavior. They're uh, intrinsic. They're unconscious. We don't think when we see something, oh, that's, that's this archetype. But we recognize. We recognize the rebel in James Dean. We recognize um, the caregiver in Mother Teresa. Those are archetypal images and people. And when you apply them to your brand, it's a way to call in all the people who resonate with those archetypes. Mm. And it's a way to be true to yourself and also to create a foundation that is very flexible. My favorite um, example is a Coca-Cola. They're the, the innocent archetype and they have taken that innocent archetype and they've managed to make it work. If you look at their marketing campaigns, they've made it work for decades You know, we used to have the, the Coca-Cola polar bears, right? These cartoon polar bears, and they were sharing their Coke with all the other animals, including the penguins somehow who were in the Arctic. And <laughs> it, was, it was all about connection, right? The, the main thing about the innocence is connection, connection stories. And now we look at Coca-Cola commercials and uh, some of the more recent ones about how we can feel so isolated online and how there can be so much cyber bullying and then you see somebody at this um internet terminal you know with all the wires and the, and the boards and they accidentally spill a bottle of coke on it and suddenly everybody gets these messages um of of love and of light and they're connecting with each other and they're looking up from their phones and they're feeling good and they've taken that innocence that innocent archetype and they've made it work for every decade. And I think they are a brilliant example that an archetype isn't limiting, that it's a foundation from which you always approach and people recognize you as that. If Coke was to come out with like a real rebel campaign, nobody would resonate with that because that's not what we recognize as yeah. being Coca-Cola now. Yeah. And you do the same thing with your own brand. You become recognizable in a, in a way that feels authentic to you. Oh, I love that authentic part because I know for coaches and obviously my clients like life, health or, you know, career coaches, they all look for being themselves or being more of themselves and finding their own authentic voice rather than obviously sound like everyone else or work with swipe files or the typical templates kind of thing. And I know you have a very um, unique or not unique opinion, but a strong opinion actually about using templates or headlines or formulas, right? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's shortcuts. And I think sometimes when you have no idea where to begin, we start with the shortcuts, the easy um, things like the formula. If you fill in the blank, then this headline will work for you. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, maybe you just wasted all your time filling out templates and form formulas to find out that that isn't, it doesn't feel like you, you know, and you want to rewrite it two months later because it just doesn't feel right or because you're not getting the same response that the other person did who sold you the template or formula because they're um, in the marketing sphere and you're in the coaching sphere and it doesn't translate. And that's why I think it's better to understand 
the why and the how behind the writing so that you can make it your own. Mm, I love that. And it's also like what a lot of, uh, let's say at least my clients or prospect uh, don't really consider is the fact that our clients evolve. So when they maybe first see a very specific like formulated template in a way, maybe they react to it because it sounds like amazing and something new. But the more people obviously use those uh, templates or swipe files and just copy and paste it, then it just doesn't let's say the new factor is gone and the only thing left is actually oh my gosh that person just sounded like that coach or i've read this before so what do you actually do you simply ignore what have been written and you also don't stand out or well let's say you stand out in a way uh, that you actually don't want to stand out right because you want to sound like you and yeah. I know that one of the questions, obviously, that's really key. And I think when I filled out or when we first started to work together in your brief, you said something like, what is unique about you or what is your USP or unique selling proposition? And I mean, our clients are asking themselves exactly the same. But I know whenever I read that question, it's like, oh, my God, <laughs> what is different about me? So how can you as a copywriter help people find out what is unique about them what is your unique approach about that yeah so understanding what's unique about you or your unique uh selling position is a standard copywriting question you'll get that from just about every copywriter on the block they will ask you what's unique about your business uh and most people stumble on that i think um in the beginning, I even stumbled upon that. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know what's unique about me. I'm a copywriter. I only do this, you know? And then we try to like, you know, say, well, I only write for websites. Well, there's a lot of other copywriters <laughs> that still only write for websites, you know? Or I, I'll, a common answer is, I don't know. People just kind of look at that question and they feel suddenly insecure about everything <laughs> like they should have it figured out but they don't and they're just like i don't know figure it out yourself yeah. and they go on to the next question and i think sometimes you do have something really unique about your business that that nobody else can claim but those people are very few and far between and for most of us the thing that is unique about our business is us Nobody is going to deliver what you're delivering exactly the way that you do um, with your experience and your history and your personality. It's not that you're the only one offering uh, this coaching package. Maybe there are thousands of other people offering the same kind of coaching package and the same kind of results, but nobody's going to do it the way that you do. And that's where the brand archetypes, understanding your archetypes, understanding your personality, and also values um, and coming from a values-based approach to marketing really sets you apart and allows people to choose you for deeper reasons, you mm -hmm. know, because they can see the common ground in personality or they can see the common ground in your values. And so they're not choosing you because, you know, you happen to uh, have a package they're looking for, or they're not choosing you because you're the cheapest. We really hope <laughs> that's not why people choose us is just price. We want them to choose us um, because of who we are and then they don't mind paying more. Yeah. But how do we communicate that? Because obviously I can't put in a post, Hey, um, work with me because I'm me and not someone else. So how can you help people kind of draw that? What is unique about me? How can you draw that out from them? And I think you also mentioned something um, about values. So are you talking about, let's say, the personal values that I have as a person? Or talk you, are you talking about the values of, obviously, the providing value to your customers? No, I'm talking about your personal values. Like if integrity is top of your list, then you need to show people that integrity is the top of your list. And you need to talk about integrity and what that means for you. So that for everybody else for whom integrity is top of their list, they can go, yes, I want to work with that person because we're on the same page here. Um, and so I, as well as the brand archetyping, um, I do a core brand values assessment where we come with your top five brand values and we merge them together and we make that very explicitly stated in yeah. your copy. 
So that's kind of really unique about you as a copywriter, right? Because I think I've, I mean, I <laughs> that's my USP. <laughs> But I kind of never heard that really from anyone else. I think I've read something about archetype and storytelling, which is obviously part of copywriting. And I think uh, you're going to touch about this a little bit later on, the different plots. But I also um, heard it kind of in brand and designing a little bit about archetypes, but I haven't really heard it in copywriting. So I really think it's amazing that you're talking about this one here and that you think you also prepared kind of an example to show how all the archetypes and personal values of people kind of come together in a statement that really expresses what is my unique selling proposition and who am I and what do I stand for or what do I not stand for? Yeah, so I'm certainly not the only copywriter out there who talks about archetypes and values, but um, I, think it, I think it's essential to communicating to your clients. And I did prepare a, a brand statement and I've, I've shown you what a crappy first draft looks like. And then we'll talk about how we refine that because I think whenever we start to talk about our industry, our business, our values, we come out very sounding very cliched, you know, <laughs> I think the cliches naturally flow. Um, they're cliched because they're overused, which means they're top of mind when you're trying to write things. And, uh, so I will walk you through that example and show you what to do about the cliches and how your archetypes and values can show up in your words. So would you say that tapping into your full potential is cliche? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes. Obviously, <laughs> it's kind of saying, and it's just getting so cliche, really. And um, I know Chess prepared that brand statement example kind of for us, and you will see it. It's incredible how many cliches you use without even kind of realizing it or you realize it, but then you don't know how to say it differently. Um, and I think I'm not the only one who struggles a little bit with that. No. And I even use cliches when I write my first draft, uh, is all about just getting the ideas down on paper. So I let it flow. And every time I hit a cliche, I just circle it and keep writing. And so that I know that I can come back and fix it later, but yeah. it's not about stopping that creative flow or stopping the ideas getting on the page. You don't want to overthink every sentence while you're trying to just get your ideas out. Um, so yeah, even I write cliches in all of my copy before I go and fix it. That's good to know. That feels better now. One question before we move into your example. So the archetypes and values are obviously all about us. But if I um, just recall, obviously, a lot of blogs and free articles that I've read and resources, everyone says, well, you need to focus um, on your clients. It's all about your clients, what they want and their pains and challenges and emotions and all that stuff. So how does that kind of them and me fit together? Yeah, there is a, a balance or like a, a sweet spot that you have to find between talking about yourself and talking about your clients. Your clients have to be very clear on what you do and how you can help them. I think for me, there you will always be aligned on your values. And so you kind of can't go wrong talking about values, how that works for your client, how that um, the values are felt in their pain points, how those values show up and how they are dreaming about how they want their life to be. That is always going to be in alignment. You know, I, I hate the advice and it's really prevalent in the coaching world that um, your ideal client is you five years ago. And I know I had that when I first started out, I hired a business coach and she said to me, your ideal client is you five years ago. And I'm like, me five years ago, I was a stay at home mom. <laughs> stay at home moms don't need copywriters. How is that my ideal client? <laughs> I need somebody with a business. Five years ago, I didn't have one. Um, and she really argued with me <laughs> about how my ideal client was a former version of myself. And I thought, no, it, it, it doesn't work that way for me. I've, I have always you know, once I, I learned copywriting and I put up shop as a copywriter, then I didn't never need to hire a copywriter. <laughs> so, but I think that there does have to be an alignment between you and them. There does have to be common ground. And for me, that is always the values um, that, that do that work. Yeah. I think if you guys out there just want to check out Chess's book, I think you sell it on Amazon.com. 
com.co.uk obviously on Canadian CA, yeah, yeah I think it's on all the Amazons <laughs> yeah can you just share the title quickly again uh, the power of personality for your small business so if you're interested in the book I will put the link um, below this video in the description sections so you can just click on there and then go shopping if you want to Okay, now, if you're ready, Chess, can we look at that brand essence statement? And maybe before we dive in, why do we actually need a brand essence statement? I think it's a lot of clarity. Clarity for, uh, it's a very concise statement that tells you who you are, what you do, and what you stand for. So it's got your beliefs wrapped into what you do and who you serve and how you serve them. And for me, it's a foundational piece whenever I have a new client. Even if they haven't hired me to write a brand statement, I always start there. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the themes that are coming up, the things that feel really important. And I pull from that to write the sales page or I pull from that to make the tagline or whatever it is that I'm writing. Um, so I think it gives you a lot of clarity. Mm -hmm. And then I think it gives you kind of that, that beginning place where you can start from there and build on it. Yeah, and kind of repurpose, right, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so to write everything brand new every time. <laughs> it sounds like really the foundation kind of piece uh, so that they can kind of connect to you and hopefully stop comparing prices, what a lot of coaches are kind of, oh, but they're all just, you know, price tag or price shoppers. But that's actually not true. If you can stand out and be really clear about who you are, what you offer and who you serve, I think that makes all the difference in the world. And people feel great about that because they know you're the right coach to help them. Okay. Yeah, if you have a compelling enough reason for them to choose you, it won't matter what the price is. I love that. I love that. Genius. Yeah. Our <laughs> Brooks myth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I will share my screen. Yes. Share. So I think you prepared a little bit like the first crappy draft for us. Um, and it's actually also giving a little bit of insights into your workflow, if I'm right. So you don't just write one piece and it's, genius and perfect from the kind of first second, you're actually going through a process yourself when you're writing. Yes. Oh, and I was not on the first screen. Hold on. No worries. Technical difficulties. Yes, <laughs> yeah, so the tech gremlins, they're just everywhere. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about creating a uh, brand statement or a brand essence statement or brand positioning statement. Different people will call it different things. So I have created a not real business that I have called Live It, Dream It Life Coaching. Ooh. I have assigned them some archetypes and values. So the archetypes are visionary, caregiver, and rebel. So most coaching businesses will either be caregiver or visionary archetypes. Those are the two main archetypes for coaches. And then That's interesting. All, the other, all the other archetypes also fit in there. Their values, they value nonconformity, that's the rebel, transformation, that's their visionary, they're supportive and non-judgmental, and that's the caregiver part. Love their it. ideal clients for this uh, business are women in their 30s who are dissatisfied with life and they want more, more connection in relationships, more fulfillment at work, more freedom to choose what their life looks like. These women feel trapped in the status quo and they want courage or permission to break out of it without blowing up their life. They like the life they want. They just need it to be more fulfilling. They don't want to go live in a yurt. Love it. Okay, so elements to include in a brand statement, who you are, what you do, and who you do it for. That should be the first sentence of your homepage just for SEO purposes. <laughs> um, but it's also the first statement in our brand statement, first sentence. Uh, second thing, what you believe or what you stand for. And the third thing we like to include is what you're not, what you stand against, who you don't serve, or what you don't do. And it just gives an extra layer of clarity and it allows people to self-select if you're not what they're looking for. And we really want them to do that. We don't want you to be wasting time booking discovery calls with people who don't really, they're not going to be a good fit. 
Yeah, so it's kind of the strategy of attracting the right ones, but also repelling the wrong ones without necessarily wasting time, right? Exactly. Love it. Okay, so here is my crappy first draft. Live It, Dream It Coaching is the vision of Dr. Jane Doe, who has dedicated her life to helping women step into their personal power. We believe dissatisfaction can be a catalyst to design the life you're dreaming of. Deeper connections in your relationships, more fulfillment and alignment at work. Living your best life is about saying, can I swear? I guess so, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I won't. I'll say about saying effort to the status quo so you can speak your truth and reclaim the power to shape your destiny. I'm sorry, I didn't even ask before I started. So that's the rebel. That's the rebel coming out, right? If she's a rebel brand, the odd swear word is going to be on brand for her. It kind of gives you the idea that she's a tell it like it is, you know, straight shooter. So this is my crappy first draft. Let's see. So the visionary archetype we can see coming through with the words, the vision and step into your personal power. That's the transformation catalyst. That is a visionary word and the life you're dreaming of, right? That vision that you have for your life. We can see the caregiver uh, archetype coming in with deeper connections in your relationships. And we see the rebel archetype talking about dissatisfaction, right? Saying effort to the status quo, speaking your truth and reclaiming your power. That's all rebel um, ideas and rebel words. So when you write the first draft, are you kind of already thinking? Maybe it's kind of innate in your case, but how do you come up with those words? Is it just coincidence that you use them and they're kind of then matching to the archetype? Or how should I say, are you getting yourself into the mindset of those people and think about how would they say it? A lot of it is coming from what my client is telling me. So if I slip back here a couple of slides, right? So if this is my client, they're telling me about their clients. They're telling me they want connection and relationships. They're telling me they want more fulfillment at work. They're telling me that they feel trapped in the status quo. So I'm taking those ideas that come from my creative brief, something that all of my clients fill out, that tell me all about them and their clients and their business. And I'm taking those ideas and they become the bones of what I'm working for. So you can see that here, I talk about deeper connections in your relationships, exactly what they told me, saying effort to the status quo. I reworded what they told me. Um, and I talk about the dissatisfaction that their clients feel. So that's where, that's where it begins. It begins with the words that my clients use to describe their, uh, the people that they serve. Yeah. And you might just amplify them a little bit. Oh, so let's yes. say saying F to the status quo kind of to really reflect that rebel uh, personality in them. Yeah, so I, I for sure, I tweak them, I change them around. I'm not necessarily taking my clients' words word for word and just plunking it on the page, but that's where the ideas start for mm -hmm. me. So what is so, so when it comes to that draft? From okay, so we have, I've got two things here that are the kiss of death to every copy, and that is vagueness and cliches. So we say the vague, helping women. Okay, well, is that all women universally around the world? It's very vague. What kind of women? Helping them do what? Uh, deeper connections in your relationships. What does that actually mean? How does that, what does that look like? More fulfillment and alignment at work. Again, what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, what does it feel like to be more fulfilled? Or what does it feel like to be aligned at work? Um, and cliches, we've got step into your personal power, one of my favorite coaching cliches, um, design the life you're dreaming of, living your best life, uh, speaking your truth, all cliches, uh, reclaim the power to shape your destiny. That feels kind of cliche. I don't know if it's really a saying or if it's just cheesy, but. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now looking at you know how you pointed out those two things um i have to admit well 
I think that will be me. That will be my draft. <laughs> and I would actually be proud of in a way <laughs> because it sounds right a little bit. It sounds sophisticated. It's nice to read, but it doesn't obviously mean or tell a lot. Yes. And it, my crappy first drafts all start out this way too. They sound great. And, but when you actually look a little bit closer, um, <laughs> there are some problems, but that's okay. That's why we edit. That's why there's more than one draft of everything. Yeah. So let's look. Um, this is the question that I love to use when I'm trying to unpack a cliche. So if my cliche is stepping into your personal power, I ask, what does that look like for these clients? So my client's clients, but what does that look like for the client? Does that look like uh, confidently walking into the boardroom to present? Mm -hmm. Does that look like uh, being able to say no <laughs> to the people in your life who are sucking your time and energy. You know, it could look a lot of different ways. And sometimes you have to ask that question a number of times to get to a place that is specific and true for your clients. But let's assume that it would be in an executive woman and she obviously has different roles, right? Like she's in that executive position, but you might also have a family at home as a mom and a partner, maybe even doing some things with charity. So which one do you actually then pick? Is it confident? I think it depends on what you're helping her with as a coach. Mm. Are you helping her with her whole life? Are you helping her just with her position at work? Are you helping her with um, her relation, her personal relationships, you know, with her significant other, with her kids, with her parents? I think the part that you choose to focus on is the part that you're going to help with. Okay, so let me give you an example of the, the stepping into your personal power. So this was a vague statement um, that was in our original crappy first draft, yeah. helping women step into their personal power. So which women, helping them how, and what does it look like to step into your personal power? So for this uh, imaginary business, I have said that they're going to support, supporting career women as they transition to soulful, purpose-driven positions they love. So it's a little bit more clearer now. We're not just helping all of womankind and we're telling you what that personal power is. It's a soulful purpose-driven position that they love. Now those words are still a little vague. You could still refine them more if you wanted to spend more time on what that looks like in your client. You could continue to drill down. For our purposes today, we're going to say that this is a clearer statement, a more specific statement than helping women step into their personal power. Um, so in this case, we know that helping is supporting through a transition. We know that we're targeting career women and positions implies to me that they don't want to become entrepreneurs. I know so many coaches help women go from uh, the world of work to the world of entrepreneurship. And I think this coach, this imaginary business is a little bit different in that they're staying in the corporate world and that's okay too. That's a valid choice. So they like the world of work. They just wish things were different. So there's still room for further clarification, like I said, and more specific specificity, but I think we're on the right track. Mm, I like it. And it's kind of so important. I know when I first kind of outsourced, um, you know, copywriting or pieces of copywriting. Um, and I think I have to admit it was like something like five or so. I was like, why do they ask me so many questions? And why can't they figure it out on their own? I can write it myself, you know, until I answer all the questions. But I think the annoyance that kind of I had was because I didn't have clarity myself. And, yes. and, and, and really every good copywriter should ask back and ask for that clarification because it really helps you to, in the end, nail your message and stand out and be understood and be clear to your ideal client if it's really you that they should work with or not. So I really love it. I know it's a little bit of a pain in the butt <laughs> to drill <laughs> down so much because in the end, you just wanted to have your copy and put it on your website or email, but it's so important to be clear. So I, I love that you brought this one up. 
Okay, so here's my final draft. I'll sh first show you um, where each of the archetypes are still showing up. Uh, we have Limit Dream at Coaching is the vision of Dr. Jane Doe, who's devoted her life to supporting career women as they transition into soulful, purpose-driven positions. We believe dissatisfaction can be a clue and a catalyst to find work that's more aligned with your values and talents. We believe you can cultivate positive relationships with all your colleagues. Yes, even that guy. And we believe you don't need to ditch the boardroom to find fulfillment. Because giving yourself permission to say F it to the status quo doesn't have to mean destroying everything you've built and starting over from scratch. All it takes is a little courage and creativity. So we've gotten a lot more specific about who we're working with and how we're helping them in this version. We still have the visionary showing up, uh, the vision, the word, the transition, right? Visionary is all about transformation, transition into soulful purpose-driven positions, um, the fact that you don't need to ditch the boardroom to find fulfillment, that feels kind of very visionary for me because a lot of people feel like that's the only way, you know? Yeah. And all it takes is a little courage and creativity, right? That's all very visionary as well. The caregiver, we've taught, we have words like devoted, supporting, aligned with your values and talents, and positive relationships, all very nurturing uh, vocabulary and language that shows we're caregiver archetype and the rebel is still in here with the dissatisfaction that can be included in a catalyst and because giving yourself permission to say effort to the status quo that's still the rebel here and not everything changed you know from the fir first draft to the second we have a lot of changes but I like that dissatisfaction can be a catalyst. I really like that idea and I just played with it a little bit. I liked the whole giving yourself permission to say F it to the status quo. That felt really rebel. I liked it. And then I qualified it by saying it doesn't mean destroying everything you've built because that's not what our clients want to do with their lives. Yeah, love it. It's incredible. Wow. And I, I love that you can see all those different archetypes kind of coming together and that they also potentially you really need to be together in that copy because no one of us, I guess, is just one thing or have just like one archetype, but we're all a mix. So I remember when I read your book and went through the archetypes, there were almost all archetypes where I said, oh, I have a little bit of that one and I have a little bit of that one. Whereas obviously there, for me, the um, Explorer was one of the one where I was like, without a shadow of a doubt, that's kind of 100% me. Whereas with the others, I was like, oh, it could be me. And here it's a little bit of me. But we're all kind of, yeah, multifaceted. Yes. And if you want to talk about individual human beings, not brands, we do have access to all 12 archetypes within yeah. us. And you access them in different situations and with different people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's true that we're going to favor one or more, uh, like maybe one to three more than the others. But certainly as individuals, all of those archetypes exist within us. We have access to all of them. When it comes to branding your business, <laughs> I always choose the top three. We never want to be one dimensional. Um, but at the same point, if you looked at your business and went, well, sometimes it's this and sometimes it's that, and maybe it's seven or eight of the 12, that starts to get really confusing um, and it starts to feel really inconsistent. So by choosing a top three, we make sure that we are not one dimensional, but we're also giving our brand consistency. Yeah, I love that. And this is kind of how you can really write all of your copies, right? Like emails or social media posts or I, I know that you um, are also talking about how you can or I think you mentioned it at the beginning how you can repurpose then things out of um, your brand essence statement for other things so what can you give us an example with this one here yeah for sure so this like I said is the foundation piece that I use I love the sentence you don't need to ditch the boardroom to find fulfillment um, and I think I would turn that into a headline for my sales page. Mm, love it. Don't need to ditch the boardroom to find fulfillment. And then we're going to talk about, uh, we talk about the dissatisfaction can be a clue and a catalyst. So in my sales page, I would talk about what that dissatisfaction looks like and feels like at work. So you get very specific, right? And then we talk about how that can change. 
you don't have to leave the boardroom. This is what we can do and what it feels like and looks like to have work that feels aligned with you, that feels uh, purposeful and fulfilling. And I think that would be kind of how my sales page, I would structure that. Um, but I would, yeah, I would for sure start with, you don't need to ditch the boardroom to find fulfillment. That would be my headline. Yeah, um, brilliant. Yeah, and the about page, again, I could use the... Um, the idea that Dr. Jane Doe has devoted her life to supporting career women as they transition into different positions. So maybe that was something that she did for herself. Um, and I could talk a little bit about her journey and how that helps my client know that she gets them, that she understands them. Or maybe it wasn't her journey. Maybe it was um, a best friend that she watched go through trying to transition into a more purposeful, fulfilling position at work and all the challenges that she watched this friend over, you know, go through and how that creates empathy and awareness of what my, the client is going through too right now. And I think, yeah. Now talking about the about page, I know there is a saying out there that the about page is the most important page on your entire website. So What's your take on that? And is it actually, I, I don't know how often I changed my about page because I felt like what I wrote at the beginning when I started my business in 2014 is obviously I evolved and I grew, so it's not relevant right now. So I feel like a little bit with my story that I have a, <laughs> like my life story is always changing. So what are your thoughts about A, the importance of an about me page and changing potentially stories on there to connect with your reader? Yeah, they say that the about page is the most visited page on your website. Um, and I think especially when we talk about a coaching niche, you want to know who you're working with, right? If you don't feel like you have a good vibe with that person, if you don't feel understood by that person, then you're going to go look for another coach. I think that's especially true for coaches. Mm. Um, so my about page has had many... Right, and not with a brand that may yes. have multiple kind of people you deal with. You're working with a coach and um, you open really up about your life and maybe about situations that you haven't even admitted or talked about like to your partner or your spouse, and maybe even haven't admitted to yourself yet. So it needs to be that trust and connection there. So I love what you said about the about page. Yeah, I know for me, I've had many, many iterations of my about page over the yes, years. I'm not alone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah, I think as we evolve as entrepreneurs, it is completely natural for our about page to evolve as well. When I first uh, started out, I think my about page, my first about page was basically a resume because I came from the world of work where you had a resume and a cover letter. And so when somebody asked you about you, you're like, here's my resume. Um, <laughs> and then I realized that about pages on the internet were a little bit different. <laughs> and I think the first story I told was that transition from stay at home mom to copywriter and how I had uh, felt dissatisfied with, you know, I think, five years of the ABCs and, and one, two, threes and reading and Sesame street. And I just felt like my brain was shrinking and I needed to do something that was more uh, creative and stimulating for me. And I talked about how I'm not good at the MLM style and I'm the worst, the queen of Pinterest fail, I think was a phrase that I used. <laughs> and that was my first one. And it was true. It, it was absolutely true. And then I talked about, I think the next version of my about page was talking about the dissatisfaction that I really felt when I was teaching. Um, I happened to teach at a school where it was a very toxic environment, work environment, and how that really got me down and how writing became um, an, almost an exercise in healing those mm -hmm. wounds for me and how writing for other women who found their voice who uh, were powerful and were creating things in the world was so inspiring for me coming from a, you know, a toxic work environment and then a stay at home mom environment, which was lovely and very, um, very isolated too, right. To this business that inspired me in ways that I didn't even know that I needed to be inspired. 
Um, and my, my current version focuses more on how it helped me find my voice that I didn't realize was gone until I started writing for other women in their businesses online. And I realized how much of a voice I didn't have in my personal life and how this business became actually a catalyst for so many changes for me personally. And I think every time we tell our story, we find a little bit more courage to be a little bit more vulnerable. We're able to like peel back the next layer and it just takes time. It's taken years to get to the current version that it's at. I'm sure in a couple of years time, it will look nothing like what it does right now. And that's totally fine. Oh my gosh, what a relief for all of us and obviously also for me because I feel like, oh my gosh, there are just too many different versions of me out there. <laughs> and if people followed me from the beginning, it's like, who is this person? Once she said this, then she said this. But in the end, it's really um, obviously that development and that growth. But it's also just obviously putting a spotlight onto a very specific piece of the journey. Uh, you obviously don't put your entire life on there. Uh, but just yes. a specific piece. So with your about page, I know you have, I think, something in your shop, the anatomy of a sales page. Do you have anything similar, an, an about page, like a structure or a framework? I don't have anything specifically for the about page yet. Um, and I think that's because there's so much room for creativity in the way that you tell your story. It's hard to give people, uh, you must do this. Um, on your sales page. If there was one, you know, quote unquote rule and rules are made to be broken that I would say it's that you need to talk about you, your story, and you also need to talk about your client's story and how that works together. So some people start off talking about themselves, me, and then you, and then us together. And other people start off talking about the client and then me, and then us together. And those three elements, however you do it, whether you use a timeline, whether you're telling paragraphs, whether you've got some, I don't know, creative visual way of creating that story that you and me and us together always needs to be there. Mm, so it comes back again to the sweet spot, right? Between the you and me slash sweet spot means us and how we kind of fit together. So I know that with the archetypes, obviously, um, I'm not sure if it's linked to the archetypes, but in marketing at the moment, and I guess, well, not at the moment, it was so in the past, and I guess it will be in the uh, future, it's all about storytelling, right? So what do you think about storytelling and uh, copywriting? And is it something that we should include in an about page or can use in some way? Yeah, I think storytelling is essential. There's actually a lot of brain science, um, there's my psychology coming out again, that supports that we process information in storytelling forms in a way that we don't process anything else. And it really creates that emotional connection, which we all know is essential if you want somebody to buy from you. you Every decision to buy is emotional first. And the way to get people emotionally connected is to tell a story. So I think storytelling is essential to copywriting. I think we need to throw out just about everything we learned about storytelling in grammar school or grade school or elementary and realize that you can tell a story in a single sentence. Your storytelling doesn't have to be linear, you know, like when you're a little kid and you're like, it began here <laughs> and then this happened and this happened and this is what happened at the end. That is not the only format for storytelling, thankfully. And that's not the format that your, your website needs to take. You can tell a story in a single sentence. Um, there are three plots, again, backed by psychology that uh, we really connect into. And those are the creativity plot, the connection plot, and the challenge plot. So the challenge plot is your hero story, right? It's every superhero movie that you've ever had, you know, and it's the hero's journey. If you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, that is the challenge story, right? It's 
I had this plan or this idea, and then there was this obstacle, this obstacle, this obstacle, this obstacle, but I overcame them all. And sometimes I had help along the way. And then I achieved what it was, my goal, my outcome that I was looking for. The, connect to, uh, the connection plot is, is all about that. It's about bridging gaps between people, between ideas. Um, it could, that bridge could be, could be anything. Um, let me think of a movie. Connection plot. I'm not going to come up with one on the spot. Invictus, that's a connection movie. It's also a little bit challenged too. Um, you know, where do you bridge, where do you bridge uh, race or ethnicity or gender or there's something that is dividing you and someone else and it's about creating the bridge for that. That's what connection is. And the third plot is the creativity plot. So if you're familiar with MacGyver, either like the yeah. 1980s version or the current version, um, every plot of a MacGyver show is a creativity plot. It's um, about taking these objects that don't seem to work together and creating something new that uh, solves a problem or gets you out of a problem or is something that's beautiful. It's, it's that creative spark and it's that transformational story, mm -hmm. creative um, stories work really well for visionary archetypes. So are there any plots that work better for some archetypes than other or um, let's say and is it depending on the business? So let's say if I may be a relationship coach, should I rather focus on the connection plot? I, I, there are archetypes that lend themselves to um, certain plots better than others. So the hero archetype obviously does really well with a challenge plot. The caregiver uh, does really well with a connection plot. The visionary does really well with the creative plot. So does um, the artist. The artist is a creative um, plot. So yeah, there are certain archetypes that lend themselves better to other plots. Mm, love it. And would you say businesses as well? like the niche that maybe a coach chooses? I think you could make it work for any niche, mm -hmm. honestly. So any really plot for any niche. You and maybe your story, um, what you choose rather than necessarily the business that you run. Yeah, I think for me, I would base it more on archetypes, less on uh, the niche or the business. Yeah. So you just mentioned now, obviously, the three plots and with the archetypes and all this stuff, but how, and you mentioned at the beginning that it, it's possible to have a story in one sentence. And I know that one of the key questions I hear from my clients, no matter if you do a lead magnet or email or whatever we kind of create or set up, it's always like, so how many words? Like, should it be short? Should it be long? Um, so what's your take on that? Um, I think... I think when it comes to emails and things like that, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, if you look at Seth Godin, who is um, a brilliant marketer and has thousands of followers, I read him every single day. He puts out a blog every single day, an email, and I'm, I get the email. His are almost always very short. He has the ability to be concise and profound in a very, and in a way that is unique to him. And I have never been able to replicate. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at some of the other marketers that I, that I love, they write really long blog posts, really long emails, and I'll see them in my inbox and I'll know that it's going to be good, but I also know that I need to set aside to time to really get through it. Mm. And, they make both work. I think you don't also have to be married to one. I started writing very long blog posts and every blog post was fairly lengthy. And then I had to almost give myself permission to write short. I felt like if I was done in a couple of paragraphs, like I had to keep going, you know? And it's like, no, you made your point move on. <laughs> Everybody can go enjoy their day now. You don't have to keep writing. So if you have done really long form stuff in the past, don't be afraid to go short. If you have done short, you can explore long and see how that feels. When it comes to things like blog posts um, and emails, 
I think length can be very flexible. When it comes to sales pages, which is the number one question that I get asked, is how long does my sales page have to be? Yeah. Um, there are really three factors that determine length. Number one is your price. The more expensive the thing is that you're trying to sell, the, the package, the coaching package, the more convincing you're going to have to do. So if you're selling a, uh, let's say, a, I don't know, a one week intensive for $597, and then on the other hand, you've got this 12 month, $10,000 thing, guess which one you're going to have to write more for to convince people to even come on the call? You're going to have to write more for the more expensive item. The second thing is tangibility. If you are selling something like this gorgeous mug that I can see and I can hold and I can feel it and I will use it every day with my coffee or in this case water, then you don't have to sell me very hard on the mug. I can see it. I, I can see for myself that I will use it. Um, if you're selling something like more fulfillment, more peace, greater joy, that are arguably a heck of a lot more important than a mug, but because they're intangible, I can't see peace, I can't feel peace, I can't taste it, I can't hear it, then you have to convince me that you're gonna really be able to help me find that and what that looks like in my life. So the more intangible the concept, the longer the sales page, the more convincing you're gonna have to do. And the third factor, is i'm gonna go blank on this third factor watch it um price tangibility oh warmth warmth of audience <laughs> there we go uh you should arguably always be selling to a warm audience so a warm audience is people that have already interacted with your brand they're already on your email list they've already worked with you in the past those are all warm audiences less convincing for the people who know you well um, if you're writing an ad for Facebook or Instagram, you only have a limited amount of space, but arguably you have to be a lot more convincing to a cold audience when you're putting something on social media, even if it's just a post, not necessarily an ad, but a post on Instagram, a post on Facebook, a post on, um, what else do people use? Twitter. You have to convince people a lot more because you're selling to people who don't know your brand and most brands, uh, the general rule is that they need to interact with your brand at least seven times before they'll be willing to buy. I would say that's very individual. Some people take a lot more than seven. Some people jump right in. Um, and I would think it depends a little bit on what you're selling to, uh, whether or not that person feels comfortable diving in faster than that. But you have to know that when you're selling to a cold audience, when you're expecting eyeballs on the page who haven't ever seen it before, then you write longer more convincing mm. yeah and i think i've i've even read a study or heard about um that it's now with the internet thing obviously like 14 times or 13 or 14 times the touch points which kind of makes sense because we're getting a little bit more i would say hesitant um towards buying online because some of us simply just have been burned uh yeah. online and not getting the value out that we kind of put money buys in so um, I get it. I haven't seen that study, but I 100% agree. Yeah, yeah, we're a lot more, um, I guess, cynical or jaded, or we have that, yeah. that yes. BS, <laughs> BS radar that's finely tuned and goes off at the slightest yeah. you know, provocation. We're more conscious of our approach, I would say. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, that kind of approach. So when you, I know you have some helpful book books in your shop. So do you cover that, um, what you just mentioned anywhere in there? Like, is it in the, yeah, so that's in the, I have a, a product called the anatomy of a sales page workbook. So it's a workbook that you can actually, you will have prompts and answer questions where I explain all of the different sections of a sales page and the psychology behind them. So why you're writing this section so that you don't just, it's not a template. Um, I also talk about the three uh, factors for determining length in that one. 
Oh, I love it. So if you want to have that, I put the link below this video, but it's also hurtlinescopywritingstudio.com slash shop if you want to head there. Obviously not now, continue to watch the video because I know Chess has more golden nuggets to share, but uh, you can obviously do it after the video ends. So when you write the sales page or emails or posts, or it doesn't matter, what is actually the editing process that you apply? We obviously learned the first draft is always shitty-ish or crappy, um, and you do your editing, you put a lot of thinking in there, but what are some quick editing tips that our watchers can apply to turn their copy maybe from a, I don't know, five to a seven or to an eight with just a few things to tweak? Yeah, so for me, I always do my first draft with enough time that I can walk away from it for 24 hours before I come back to do any kind of editing because, uh, when you're really familiar and you've worked with it and you've been slaving over it for a couple of hours, your brain will fill in what you want to see on the page because you're, you're, you already know what you want to say. And that may or may not have actually come across on the page. So if you give it 24 hours, turn that part of your brain off, and then you come back to it with fresh eyes, you're able to pick up on places where you weren't clear. Um, a quick tip that I love the most persuasive word in your entire vocabulary is because. Mm. And psychology has shown us that that little word because is magical, that it, we automatically believe whatever comes after the word because. Um, mostly because our brains are lazy and we don't really want to search through all of our memories and our experiences and things we've read to disprove every time we encounter with that word and whatever comes after it. So we automatically believe anything that comes after the word because, which makes it very powerful for persuading people. And I would say the more um, relevant your reasons, the better, although it doesn't actually have to be. They did a study where uh, they had photocopiers in a, in a standard work office environment, and they tried to have somebody cut in line to the photocopier. Um, which can be the equivalent of taking your life in your hands in some places. <laughs> we all remember that lineup for the photocopier, right? Um, and the person would try to cut in line and say, well, can I just uh, do photos? Or can I, can I photocopy before you? And the answer was always no. If you just ask, can I go first? The answer is no. So then they decided, we'll give the people a reason. Can I go first because I'm really crunched for this deadline? And lo and behold, they almost always were able to go first. And the only thing they changed was because and a valid reason after it. Mm. So then they got curious and they're like, well, what if it's not a real reason? And so they had people say, can I go first because I need to, <laughs> which is not a good reason, right? Um, and <laughs> and people would still let them go first. <laughs> and that's where they realized that this word because is really the, the key factor. And so adding that into places in your copy where you really want to convince someone of something, where it's a really important point that you want to make, it's a fantastic word to have. Oh, love it. I definitely need to use that a little bit more <laughs> and obviously include a good reason because sometimes I'm just like, well, I just ditch it in a way because I think like, oh, there is no real good reason. So I rather don't write it or I actually don't even think about it. Um, so what about, I, I think we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, right? What about when I write cliches and obviously I know when I first started out with coaching me, I'm not a native English speaker. So I was first completely in awe with all that new vocabulary that I needed to learn. And then I was so proud that I could use the full potential and personal development and underlying beliefs and all that stuff. Um, so how can I step away from that cliches? Is there online resources that I can tap into? Does it just mean I would need to read more books? Um, or how can I kind of get better at writing um, and infuse my copy with fresh ideas? Um, yeah, so cliche, every, every industry has its own jargon. Um, 
you know, we get down on lawyers and, and doctors for all the jargon that they use, but really every industry has its own jargon. And even as a copywriter, I will throw out marketing terms and forget that my client may not know what those mean yet. You know, we talked about the USP, the unique selling position yeah. earlier. And um, when we talk about funnels, you know, copywriters love to talk about your funnels and people are like, I don't know what that means. What does that actually look like in my business? And that's the, the best, really the best tip is to just sit down and go, what does that actually look like for my clients and keep drilling down and drilling down until you have a very specific, you know, a funnel is the emails that you send to start a conversation before you make a sale, you know, yeah, break it down. Um, when I'm writing copy and I need different words, I run to the thesaurus mm -hmm. all the time. I type T on my keyboard and thesaurus automatically comes up. Um, and there's another one called the, the idioms dictionary where you can put in a phrase or a word, like, um, you could put in the word heart and it will tell you all of the popular phrases that have to do with heart. And then you can take those phrases and you can turn them on their head or swap out a word or two so that it feels fresh. And the other one, another one is the rhyming dictionary. It does more than just rhyming. We don't want copy that rhymes. That sounds, <laughs> it feels like nursery school again. <laughs> but it's a neat little tool in that there are um, a bunch of other tabs that you can open. So you can find words that are alliterative or you can find words that have the right uh, length to them. You can look it up by syllable. I think you can even, they even have like a Shakespearean search, Ooh. which, um, which I did use one time for my own business because it's heart lines. And I think I put on the Shakespeare search and I put in the word heart. Mm -hmm. And then there's all these phrases that have to do with the heart and of the heart. And a lot of Shakespeare has become common, um, yeah. you know, popular yes. ways of saying things. So it's a neat little tool too to check out. Yeah. Wow. That's I will actually link all those tips that you just gave or all the resources that you just mentioned in the description below this video. So if you obviously want to check out something, check the description below and yeah, improve your copy in a few clicks. All free. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's obviously always the best part of it. <laughs> so how do you actually start out when let's say I know you have an extensive brief and I remember when I filled it um kind of I, in the first time I was like oh my gosh so many questions so kind of digging deep and and it was a lot of clarity for myself right I couldn't fill it in in one go because I literally needed to go away and come back so you don't necessarily know your clients beforehand and the only thing that you have is their brief. So how do you kind of tap into their world and their ideal client's world and then come up with that copy? Yeah, the brief is a big part of it for me. There's a little bit of cyber stalking involved. Right? <laughs> I go through the current website and I read everything. I'll read the blog posts. I'll go follow them on social media and read through what they're writing on social media. Um, so there's a little bit of cyber stalking, but mostly it's the creative brief. And that is where all of my ideas really um, begin. And it's, it's 45 questions long. I know. It was uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I have had people who, it, it, honestly, the amount of time that it takes you to, to do it really speaks to the amount of clarity that you have about your business and the direction that you're headed and your clients. Um, because I've had some people who completed it in like an hour and I've had other people message me and they're like, I'm on hour four. When does it end? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, I can't help you. You need to know these things. And I find because I work with a lot of people who are just starting out that it's the clarity they didn't even know that they needed. Mm. Um, but I've also had people who have been in business for years take that quiz and go, wow, or not quiz, brief. <laughs> and, and I have had many people say, you know, I came up with some really great nuggets of information. Can you send me a copy of my answers? And I do all the time. I, I, al I don't always send it, but it, whenever requested, I always send back the yeah. answers because I think if they found insight and they could recognize that there was insight in there, then for sure you take it. Um, 
maybe the unique thing about me is I write out all the answers by hand. Seriously? I do. I transcribe and I've had people, I've had people have 17 typed pages back to me <laughs> and I transcribe everything by hand and if everybody gets a fresh notebook, I transcribe everything by hand and there's something that happens when it goes from just reading it to actually writing it mm. that my brain makes these other connections and I'll see what's important. I'll draw a big star on the page or I'll start to get snippets of copy in my head based on something that they've written. And so mm. the, my, my margins get filled with little bits of copy that is a place to start. And by the time I finish the brief, I've got stars on the things that are important, little bits of copy that are playing in my head. And that is the place that I begin really. Wow. After 24 hours, I make myself go through the brief, write it all out yes. and then wait and come back and see if it's still as brilliant as I thought it was 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so how many edits are you kind of doing? So first you kind of write the brief out again. You already put your first ideas out there. Do you then write, uh, write your first graphic draft and then give it 24 hours? Um, yeah. After, at the end of the brief, I don't, I don't start writing until I, unless I feel like super compelled. I usually don't start writing. I do the brief and then the next day I come back and I look through again and I just look through the pieces that I noted as important. And that's when I start writing ideas. And sometimes the first day is just getting a bunch of random ideas that I can't see how they fit together down. You know, sometimes it's just, Oh, that's a, that's an amazing sentence. We'll figure out a way to use it. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, and then it's a process of, okay, this is my first draft. Yeah. And then I leave it, and then I come back. And sometimes I'll look at it, and I'll go, eh, are the archetypes really showing up here? Am I making, you know, if I, because I always explain all of my copy to the clients, can I explain to them and show them where the visionary is coming in, where the uh, rebel is coming in, where the caregiver is coming in, or have I forgotten one? And if I have forgotten one, how do I add that in to what I've already got. Um, so I'll do that as a kind of editing draft. And then I will do one um, looking at my cliches. How else do I say this? How can I be more specific? Where can I be more specific? Specific is always better. <laughs> and I'll go through and I'll just look for that. And I have different kind of filters that I use when I look at the words. Are the archetypes showing up? Are the values showing up? Um, is there, am I being vague or cliched anywhere? Is there anywhere where I am, you know, not being specific enough? Is there, am I telling the story? Am I telling the right story in the right way? And I'll look at just the storytelling piece. And when you edit, you just need one thing to focus on each time. Yeah, and for yourself, that kind of you go through, or is it just like naturally in a way now for you to just think about all those? Thousand and one things you just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a checklist that I work from. It's pretty, uh, I would say, instinctual for me at this point. You definitely could do uh, a, like an editing checklist for yourself where you think about, okay, yeah. look at the cliches, look at where I'm being vague, look at the archetypes, look at this, look at that, and go through and just look at one thing each time. Now, it doesn't take me a whole day. Like, I don't do one thing and then come back the next day and do another thing. You just go through the copy looking for one fix it, go yeah. through the copy, looking for the next thing, fix it. And I will do maybe three or four drafts before I get to a point where I'm like time for input from the client. Yeah. And I know that not every copywriter works this way, but I see it as a very collaborative process. Um, so I will get to a point where I'm like, okay, it's time for eyes on the page. I need outside feedback, something outside of my head to tell me what feels right, what feels doesn't. And a lot of times it's just the tiniest little tweak that the client wants. And they're usually pretty blown away, but other times they'll come back to me and they're like, ah, I just, this section is just, you know, and, and we'll go back and forth. What about it is not right. What, what are you feeling? You know? Yeah. 
I remember that I did a sales page with you and I think we were done after the second draft or something. There were a couple of words, but already your first draft to me was just so brilliant that there was nothing that I wanted to change apart, I think, from two words, which I didn't understand kind of from my English <laughs> or lack of English perspective, but it was just like brilliant book that you kind of delivered without knowing me really like beforehand in any way or shape. So I thought that was just brilliant. And I mean, for all the procrastinators out there, and um, including myself, who are maybe perfectionists, I think what you've just mentioned, you know, with the editing kind of process to give yourself time. I think if we're like the business owner, the coaches who do a lot of our own copy, that's what we often overlook, right? We have, we open up our task list in the morning and it says, write three emails, I don't know, for, you know, the newsletter for the next month. And then we're just so happy that we finished it, that we don't go back and look at it in a way. And if I just listen to you now, that's, I guess, for me, um, really good lesson learned is to go back to your copy to uh, just take it to the next level and to get better and better and better at it and just not accept the first draft and put that big tick just done kind of um, to it, but really go yeah. in there and look how you can improve it. And next time your copy will already be a little bit better because I guess just for you as it kind of intuitively comes when looking at a copy, what you need to change, I think it's learnable, truth to be told. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, before I was at copy, before I knew that copywriting even existed, this was not <laughs> a skill set that I had. Um, so yes, you can for sure learn it. I think when I write for myself, uh, again, I always write everything out on pen and paper. Mm. And that's my first draft. And even if all I do is take it from pen and paper and then start typing it, I will change things as I'm typing it. It gets edited as it goes on the screen. And so that is always at least one draft. Because sometimes I don't have time and I'm writing 25 emails and I have to um, get that done too. And I can't take my time to go through. But when I write them out on paper and then I put it on the screen, that's always at least one draft that it gets. So if you don't write on paper, that's fine. You can do it in like a writing app. Like uh, I love the Bear writing app. It's very pared down. Um, no distractions, but it's a great app for me to get my ideas out. And I do um, almost all my social media posts mm, Wow! on the, on the bear writing app, but pick any writing app that you love that doesn't cost you. You don't have to spend money on a writing app. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so then take it when you take it from there and you go over here, don't just copy and paste and be done. Like actually read it through and, you know, and see where can I add emphasis or where can I do yeah. that. So would you say that using pen and paper is the number one tip to, let's say, look at that blinking cursor and think like, well, you won't blink a little bit longer and the page will not be blank anymore because I've got some ideas. So what is that thing to get you unstuck, to get in the flow, to get writing? Yeah, I cannot, I cannot look at a blank page with a blinking cursor and come up with anything. It's like all creativity leaks out of my brain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I just stand there and I stare at it like everybody else does. Right. We're all just like, um, and <laughs> so I, I find tips for getting unstuck. If you have a hard time writing in, in whether it's pen and paper or whether it's on the computer, do a voice memo to yourself and talk it out. And then you can, take out the good nuggets <laughs> or clean that up, you know, take out the tangents. If you're me, cause I, when I talk, I get on tangents, but sometimes speaking it, if that's easier for you, do a voice memo and then work to transcribe it and clean it up. Um, the writing apps, the, I'm a big believer of putting inspiration in and always making sure that you have lots to pull from so that your creativity never feels like it's deserted you. You know, so whether that's reading a lot of poetry or fiction or um, going to watch people dance or taking in live musical events or going to an art gallery, whatever that is, always put the inspiration in so that when you have to sit down and talk about something, you have these ideas, these experiences that you can pull from. And they don't have to be things that you spend a lot of, a lot of money on. 
I think feeling that that inspiration well is essential in whatever you're doing. I think it helps in your coaching too. You have stories to tell when you when you're working with clients and you're coaching and, and you have things to talk about for social media. I know even the mundane things can work if you've got your eye open. I went grocery shopping once in the small town where my parents live and we were going through the bread section. My son lives solely on bread. So we were going through the bread aisle. And, and uh, I, I swear, if we had no bread in this house, he would starve. Um, and they had a, a display of donuts, but they didn't call them donuts. They called them glazed yeast rings. Mm. Right, exactly. So I took a picture of the sign and that became a social media post because I understand trying to be creative when you're naming things, but there is nothing appetizing about past the yeast ring, you know, <laughs> even though it was just a glazed donut. Um, and so even something as mundane as grocery shopping can be inspiration if you're in the mindset to, to look for things. Is there any kind of final tip you want to give uh, the watchers here, how they can, like, say, amp up their copywriting, let's say, in no time? Um, I think I just want to encourage you to experiment mm -hmm. and encourage you to play with the words and tell you that it is never done. Copywriting is never done. You never just put it out there and never look at it again. You always need to go back and tweak it and experiment with different headlines and experiment with different things. Um, do some AB testing, which is marketing jargon for changing out one thing in your copy, like just the headline and leave everything else and see if you get more people on it or change out just your, your call to action at the bottom where you ask them to take um, an action and see if that gets more people clicking, you know, it's, it's just this big playground of words. And I think mostly I just want to encourage you to keep experimenting. Don't freak out if it doesn't, if it's not working and you don't have to start from scratch. If it's not working, it's not a throw out everything situation. Yeah. I think it's definitely, obviously it's part of marketing, but I think that, science combined with let's say art or creativity is it's in marketing what you need and i love that you use uh, you know give a permission slip to really play um, and experiment around those things and it's really no different than in marketing you need to tweak you need to get out of your comfort zone you need to uh, check out and test out different maybe strategies and tactics to find that sweet spot, as Jess mentioned at the beginning, that kind of connects you uh, with your ideal clients so that you kind of get the clients that you need in your coaching business. Yeah, and, and get feedback on your words from yeah. other entrepreneurs. Exactly. They have shown that it's better to get feedback from fellow entrepreneurs than it actually is to get it from your ideal clients. Because your ideal clients don't always know what they want mm -hmm. or how to express it or what's best for them. Whereas fellow entrepreneurs know just enough about business yeah. and they don't even have to be in your industry. They don't have to be other coaches. Um, but fellow entrepreneurs can go, oh, I read this copy and but it didn't resonate with me here. Or I wish you talked more about these pain points over here, you know, and the feedback that you get from them is actually more valuable than the client who's just asking themselves, am I going to buy this? Yeah. You know, other entrepreneurs come at it with a different lens. What a brilliant tip to end this episode of uh, Sabine TV. Thank you, Chess, so much for being here, for sharing all the golden nuggets you did. I mean, it's incredible. I guess if I would have had pen and paper in my hand, it would be the third booklet because you shared so many incredible and valuable tips. But before you leave, what is, can you share a way how uh, watchers can work with you? Yeah, well, first, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Okay. Um, and my kids are going to be thrilled that I'm on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're watching this um, before Christmas, I have a 24 days of surprises coming for December. I give a different email with a different little surprise in it every day for 24 days um, in December. 
Um, otherwise, if you can head over to my website, which is heartlinescopywritingstudio.com. I have a shop where you can buy digital products if you prefer to DIY, um, or I have packages if you would like to work with me, or I have my I have my copy CPR package where if you've written the words, yeah, if you've written all the sales page and you would like an opinion on it, if you'd like me to go through it with you, then we edit in real time your sales page or whatever else it is that you're writing. I'm actually an addict of that one. So definitely try that one out. And I just sign up myself for chess Christmas series. So if you watch this video now, head to sabinebcc slash chess with a double s um and should you watch this video somewhere in the new year or obviously after we recorded it um this will redirect you to chess's website where you can sign up for her newsletter and i definitely highly recommend that you browse through her shops because there's so many different things on there like i think it was anatomy of a sales page right there was headlines how to write headlines and taglines i think you even share editing tips and just before we jump on this call you should Shared that you created new things um, between kind of the way we were talking and working together. So it's always worthwhile to check out her website. So thank you, Chess, again for being here with us. Uh, and I hope you will return soon. Absolutely, anytime. If you want to get your hands on more tips and tricks, just like you did in this video here, please subscribe to my channel, give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. I'm curious, what's one thing you want to apply in your coaching business ASAP to move your copy from okay to outstanding? Please share in the comments below as I can't wait to read your comments. As I love having you around, watch my other videos here on YouTube as they're all about how to grow your coaching business online. Bye for now and I'll see you in the next one.